In this anime, you will see a deadly game where girls have to do whatever the guys tell them to do in order to survive. And before you watch, write any comment and you will move on to the next video. Also don't forget to put a like and subscribe to the channel. Enjoy watching. High school student Kanazawa Nobuaki transfers into a new school and tries to distance himself from his new classmates. At midnight Nobuaki receives a text from someone called the king outlining the rules of the king's game. Every student must participate and follow the instructions or face death. Nobuaki is ordered to kiss Honda Natsuko. Every student in class, who all received the text, think Nobuaki is joking. Nobuaki tries to explain the game is real, making most of them angry at him. Nobuaki, who has played the game before, decides to break the rules and die, meaning Natsuko will also die. As the 24-hour deadline approaches Nobuaki waits to die only for Natsuko to appear, confess her love and kiss him with seconds to spare. Nobuaki realizes several people from class had received different instructions and rushes to find the other students with instructions. He is too late as he finds several of them have hanged themselves in their bedrooms. The surviving students, realizing the game is real, accuse Nobuaki of being the murderer. One of the students, Sata Yuichi, receives a punishment text for breaking a rule and immediately bleeds to death. Natsuko realizes that she has been assigned to make love to Teruaki Nagata and panics. Nobuaki insists that Natsuko and Taruaki should decide for themselves what to do. Nobuaki recalls the first time he played the game and how his classmates immediately turned on each other when they realized the game was real. He insists that his new class must work together to survive, no matter what the instructions are. Teruaki, desperate not to die, tries to attack Natsuko. Natsuko suddenly overpowers Teruaki and becomes cold and hostile, using the attempted attack to force Nobuaki to reveal the secret of escaping the game since he has already survived her. She swears she will survive no matter what and almost rapes Teruaki, then pulls Nobuaki away from the others and criticizes his intention to try to save everyone instead of focusing on his own survival. She loudly accuses him of trying to rape her, turning the entire class against him. She then tries to convince Mizuki, who has been instructed to send the word die to two other students, which would have resulted in their deaths, to send this message to Nobuaki. Akamatsu Kenta happens to see his classmates and Nobuaki gather at Bunko Park, but then he sees that Nobuaki was hurt, and accuses the class of beating up Nobuaki. Annoyed, Natsuko tries to convince Mizuki to send Dai to Kenta and Nobuaki, but she refuses and smashes her phone on the floor, breaking it. Kenta then carries Nobuaki to the hospital and a terrified Mizuki comes along. Then, Mizuki, Kenta and Nobuaki all went to a deserted area where Kenta was assigned by the king to give an order to a classmate and they must follow it. He decides to give himself the order to protect Mizuki's life, to make her feel better. Then Nobuaki tells Kenta and Mizuki about another flashback of another of his class classmates dying because they lost a popularity voting contest. Meanwhile, Natsuko picks up the phone Nobuaki dropped. Nobuaki tells Kenta and Mizuki about a distant village, Yankai, where the king's game was originally played, and they start traveling to Yankai to get more information to end the game. On the lengthy train ride, Nobuaki has another flashback where he deduced the king is someone in his class, and his classmate Nami, who had to give herself an order, takes that advice and orders herself to touch the king. When she touches the king, a confirmation text will be given, confirming their identity. Rhea, a mysterious girl in class, states she is the king and asks if the class will kill her, since that would end the game. However, when she takes Nami's hand and touches herself with it, there is no confirmation text. Despite touching everyone in the class, nothing happened. That night, Nobuaki finds Nami to comfort her. Nami then gets a punishment to go blind, along with a taunt from the king that they were in the class and the only way to find their identity was to to hate each other. Nobuaki gets an order to lose something important. He tries to break all his possessions in his house, even break up with Chimi, but his attempts were futile. Finally, he completed his order when Nami decided to help him by drowning herself. Rhea calls Nami stupid for killing herself even though her punishment wasn't death. She repeats she is king, stating that since she made Nami touch her instead of letting her do it herself, it was not considered valid. However, Nobuaki still doesn't kill her. After tossing him, she scolds him for his lack of resolve, stating she isn't actually king but wants to enjoy the king's game, which will be difficult to do if Nobuaki is so boring, and beat the king. Later, his classmate Yusuke begins doing research and finds information about the king's game, including the fact each classmate got a one-character text from the king before their death, and that the game was played 30 years ago in a village called Yunaki. Yusuke then dies, amongst almost half the class who broke the latest rule to not to do anything unnecessary, which was crying, deduced by Nobuaki. While waiting for the train to the village, Nobuaki gets hit in the head, 
and wakes up in a room with his hands tied. Kaori accuses Nobuaki of being the king and killing Yusuk. Nobuaki explains the situation and tells Kaori Yusuk likes her and he told Nobuaki to protect her if anything happened to him. His words cause Kaori to cry and she dies for breaking the rule. A new order was given in which one student has to roll a die, and name the number of students equal to the number rolled. The student who rolled the dice and those they named would all be punished. After a heated discussion culminating in Toshiyuki Abe threatening to kill Chimi, Naoya steps up to roll the die. He rolled a six and all the remaining classmates ended up dying, except Nobuaki, Chimi, and Ria. Ria uses the data collected between her and Yusuke and explains to Nobuaki the cause of the deaths was hypnosis from a computer virus linked to the King's game, taking the power of suggestion to the extreme. It was so extreme, the body killed its own cells. A bacterial virus did the same thing to Yanaki village, but evolved into digital form, which would then be transmitted through text messages and continued to spread. How it evolved into that is unknown, but it is unlikely it could have done so without help. Rhea developed an antivirus that could eliminate all the kings in the network by taking advantage of a bug in the program. She attempts to delete the virus, but is punished for attempting to stop the game. The bug itself was a trap set by the king. Before she dies, she tells Nobuaki she left behind a little insurance in case she lost. Nobuaki and Chimi are the only ones left. Meanwhile, in present time, Time, Mizuki gets a new phone and Nobuaki, Kenta, and her finally arrive at the bricked-up gate of Yanaki Village. While exploring Yanaki Village, now a decrepit ghost town, a house with the name Honda catches Nobuaki's eye, and he goes in while Kenta and Mizuki wait outside. He discovers a few notes from what appears to be Chimi's father and a picture with both the name Chimi and Natsuko. He deduces Chimi and Natsuko were sisters and their father is connected to the King's Game, and from Natsuko's actions earlier, she may have also been a survivor of a King's Game. Meanwhile, Mizuki experiences significant inner turmoil about whom to text Dai to, eventually deciding to text it to herself. She declares her love for Kenta, and that by sending those texts, they would die, because of Kenta failing his order, and be together forever. Angry about Mizuki's lack of resolve to live, Kenta knocks her out and sends the texts to himself and Natsuko instead on her phone. Nobuaki finds them, and they realize the texts didn't work because they were not sent from Mizuki's original phone, so Mizuki and Kenta both end up dying. Then Nobuaki gets a call from Natsuko on his own stolen phone, while mocking Nobuaki of their deaths. Teruaki tries to call someone for help but Natsuko catches him and takes his phone too. Nobuaki finds hints from a notebook indicating that the characters appearing in the king's victims' phones is a bug and that mutation is a likely way to end the game. He rushes back to his hometown to share information after suddenly getting a call from classmate Riona Matsumoto who was doing research about the king's game. Riona reveals she knows about Natsuko's late classmate Ria, who was also collecting the characters from the victims. The message Ria spelled out was, those who have hope. They were remarkably similar to the ones Riona saw Natsuko looking at after Yuichi died and may spell the same message. Natsuko gathers everybody at Bunko Park for the next order, where the class takes turns by seat order to break their fingers. The right fingers are worth plus one point each and left fingers minus one each, with the option to pass. At the end of the game, anyone with a negative point total is punished. Natsuko intends to use this to kill Nobuaki, but everyone passes. Then it is Teruaki's turn and he breaks one finger on his right hand and his entire left hand giving Natsuko minus 5. Teruaki threatens to assign minus 5 points to Natsuko unless gives back their phones. She does so but Teruaki assigns plus 1 to Nobuaki, minus 4 to Natsuko, and minus 1 to her best friend Aimi. Natsuko passes rather than break her hand. The negative point to Aimi was a test Aimi asked for, to see if Natsuko would break a finger to save her, as Teruaki did to save Natsuko, which Natsuko failed. Everyone else passes and Aimi is the last person to take a turn. She is reluctant to break her entire hand to save herself and Natsuko. Natsuko coerces Aimi to think about when she has helped her in the past, and when that fails, tackles Aimi and pins her hand to the ground, crushing her entire right hand to save herself. Aimi defends Natsuko was just scared and they were still friends, giving Natsuko plus 4 and herself plus 1. Later, Nobuaki again convinces everyone to stick together to survive, but is dismissed by Natsuko insisting there can only be one survivor like in the previous King's games. Teruaki is punished because Natsuko blocked the King's message while she had his phone, punishment for his defiance of her, and he dies. The remaining 10 students are given an order to race to MT Nugakabi, where every 8 hours the person farthest away gets punished. While Natsuko leaves everyone behind in the dust, Nobuaki repeatedly goes out of his way to help his classmates who are falling behind, despite them insisting multiple times that they don't need to be saved, insisting he could not bear to see anyone die anymore. His efforts wins him up amongst the students in last place, 
with Riona who lacks stamina and Masatoshi who got shoved down a flight of stairs by classmate Takuya. He also appears to have pushed himself to the limit as he begins to hallucinate. As they are running along the ocean, an exhausted Masatoshi becomes unconscious and falls off a bridge into the ocean. Nobuaki follows to save him but fails to do so and Masatoshi drowns. Riona then warms him up and Nobuaki regains his resolve to continue. As the 8-hour mark is imminent, Nobuaki deliberately stops to tie his shoelace, just as a death punishment text gets sent. It turns out the punishment text was for Masatoshi. Riona is furious at Nobuaki for his insensitivity. After eight more hours however, Nobuaki tries the same trick by running the opposite direction, but the text was instead sent for Aimi who was grateful for Nobuaki's earlier actions and sacrificed herself by running the opposite way. Nobuaki reveals to Riona the conclusion of his first King's game where he and Chimi were given an order to kill the person they love the most, and Chimi had killed herself for Nobuaki to survive, and Nobuaki got a text from the king with the choice to either continue the game or get punished. Meanwhile, Natsuko reaches the summit first and uses various tactics to deter her incoming classmates Takuya, Yuna, and Rina, resulting in their deaths. Nobuaki and Riona catch up with Ryu and Aya, and within minutes before the 8-hour mark, approach the summit but Natsuko stands in the way. With just 5 students remaining, can Nobuaki put a stop to the murderous king's game once and for all? The gang overpowers Natsuko and reach the summit, just as they get their next order to cut their body parts to make a human doll. Ryu offers to sacrifice first so Natsuko helps him cut his leg using a chainsaw. Seeing Ryu dead, Aya tries to strangle Natsuko but Natsuko just cuts her body off with her chainsaw. With only Nobuaki, Riona, and Natsuko remaining, they finally calm down to brainstorm how to end the game once and for all. They combine the one-letter texts from the dead classmates and finally discover the truth about the king's game. It is, in fact, an apocalyptic virus type of game that will never end unless every player dies. If there is a survivor the virus is carried on by them and the game will continue until all of humanity is destroyed. The king's game let Nobuaki survive his first game despite saying he would be punished because it needed a carrier. Natsuko tries to kill Nobuaki by strangling him for confirming her suspicions of false hope, but Riona attacks her with the chainsaw and fatally wounds her. With Natsuko seemingly dead, Riona begins declaring her love for Nobuaki but, using the last of her breath, Natsuko kills Nobuaki with the chainsaw, claiming she loved him first and refusing to let Riona take him. In the afterlife, Nobuaki is reunited with Chimi and his other dead friends, who had waited for him. As the only survivor, Riona drags Nobuaki's corpse to the beach and commits suicide by drowning herself with Nobuaki's dead body. Setsu, his childhood friend Yuhi, and their high school classmates are summoned to another world as heroes of Destinia Kingdom, at war with the demons after five years of peace. This does not surprise Setsu as he was summoned to Destinia before as the previous hero who successfully ended the last war before being abruptly returned to Japan to restart his life as a baby. While his classmates train as beginners Setsu has regained his old powers and reveals his identity to his former teammate, now a knight, Elka by spanking her, revealing her secret masochistic attraction to him. He also meets former teammates Glane and Thea who reveal Setsu had disappeared in an explosion while dueling a man named Toma, ending the war. Setsu suspects Toma has restarted the war by manipulating the demons with curse magic. Setsu decides not to reveal his identity publicly and will prevent the war by going out on his own to find Toma, leaving his teammates to train his classmates. After stealing his old sword Karamaru from Destinia's armory Yuhi asks to accompany him but he tells her to stay and train for when he returns. Setsu rescues a young girl named Ruri from a monster attack. As she is making an important delivery of the last piece of jewelry her grandfather repaired before his death Setsu agrees to escort her to the next town. There, Ruri tries to hire a ship to the demon continent, but all travel there is cancelled due to the war. Bullying royal knights harass Ruri to steal her valuables but Setsu humiliates them in front of witnesses. Adan and Setsu peeks at the jewelry while Ruri bathes and discovers it is a necklace from his previous life he enchanted with protection magic as a gift for a close friend. This worries him, if Ruri's grandfather was asked to repair it, it could only have broken if his friend was in a serious fight and may not have survived. The knights frame them as demon sympathizers and try to arrest them, but they escape when Setsu summons his old friend Leviathan, Water Dragon and Goddess of the Ocean, leaving the knights bewildered and terrified. Leviathan agrees to carry them across the sea to the demon continent. Arriving at the continent Leviathan kills a kraken then transforms into a young woman nicknamed Leviath to scold Setsu for not helping. Setsu makes deep-fried squid as an apology. Ruri reveals her customer is actually Dezestal, Dezes, Sereno, the current demon lord and old friend of Setsu and Leviya. Not wanting to waste food they take the Kraken to Valsi village who celebrate as the Kraken had ruined their fishing trade. 
During the party Ruri realizes Levaya has a crush on Setsu but is angry he vanished for five years. Vlad, Deza's bodyguard, sees the party and upon seeing Setsu has returned begs him to save Deza's. Deza's has been cursed and forced to marry Terran Sneeder, the wealthiest human merchant in the world who claims he can arrange peace since humans attacked the demon continent first. Setsu is surprised since humans believe the demons attacked first. Setsu suspects there is a conspiracy to restart the war which probably includes Terran using his merchant's network to spread false information. To rescue Deza's and interrogate Terran, Setsu and Levaya set off to Evil Barrow, Deza's castle, to stop the wedding. Deza's, who is deeply in love with Setsu, had worked hard to maintain the peace he won before disappearing. One day her necklace mysteriously broke so she sent it to be repaired but never got it back due to the new war breaking out. Terran eventually offered peace in exchange for their marriage so Deza's agreed to marry him and wear a new necklace curse to ensure her slave-like obedience. Terran reports to the conspirators he will soon own the demon continent, though they seem uninterested in whether the war ends or not. Setsu interrupts the wedding in the nick of time to prevent Terran putting the cursed necklace on Deza's, who is overjoyed at Setsu's return. Terran's bodyguard escapes to report back to the conspirators. Setsu confirms the cursed necklace was made by Toma and destroys it before returning Deza's repaired necklace to her, renewing their promise of peace. Next, Setsu decides to visit his other friend Regulus, King of the Beast Men. Terran is arrested and Deza's asks Setsu for a date after the war. Ruri is allowed to open a shop in Deza's kingdom. Setsu and Levaya depart to find Regulus. Flashbacks show Yuhi wanted to attend the same high school as Setsu, even attending extra classes but couldn't get the grades and was heartbroken, until Setsu helped her study. Now in Destinia Yuhi finds she has a talent for magic and asks Elka and Glane for additional training to become Setsu's teammate faster. Elka is convinced by her skills but not her resolve. She pits Yuhi against a low-level monster which she defeats but hesitates to kill it. Disappointed, Elka kills it and Yuhi realizes in a real fight she would only be a liability for Setsu. Thea heals her injuries and reveals Elka was only hard on her because she also wants Elka strong enough to become Setsu's teammate. Yuhi asks Glane how he found his resolve. Glane enjoys hurting his enemies but advises Yuhi to find her own type of resolve. Yuhi defeats another monster but refuses to kill it, having found her resolve to be strong enough to support Setsu without needing to kill. Elka accepts her resolve as it is the same type Setsu once had. The king abruptly decrees Yuhi and her classmates will leave for a mission to the demon continent immediately. Setsu and Levaya encounter Alizi, another of Setsu's students, and her friend Amel. Following Setsu's disappearance Alizi worked as a monster slayer and was recently hired by Zathro village to slay a dragon. Villager Amel was worried her brother had disappeared when the dragon appeared. Ali Z noticed the dragon's victims always just vanished, with no signs of a dragon attack. After injuring the dragon and driving it away Ali Z found all the villagers had gone missing, except Amel. She is now taking Amel to a city to find someone to look after her. Setsu suspects the villagers were kidnapped by powerful teleportation magic, which by coincidence lured in the dragon, making it seem the dragon was behind the disappearances. From clues in their conversation Setsu identifies Amel as the culprit. Amel reveals she is a powerful dragon in human form so Setsu and Ali Z slay her. Setsu and Levaya set off to the Beastman continent while Ali Z stays hoping to find the missing villagers. Returning to Zathro Ali Z finds Amel is alive. Her real name is Meluor, the master of monsters, and she has been kidnapping people to turn them into powerful doll soldiers for Toma's army. On the Beastman continent monster slayer Shiraniko cares for her sick sister Maniko but struggles as her medicine is expensive. After swimming for three days with Setsu on her back Levaya reaches the Beastman continent but demands a rest before going further. In the same town Shiraniko's boss Kuroinu offers her enough money to care for Maniko indefinitely if she assassinates a troublesome man, Setsu. She attacks Setsu but is easily defeated. Setsu finds she smells of curse magic so he returns her to her home but conceals her assassination attempt from Minok, for which Shiraniko is grateful. Setsu reveals Maniko isn't sick, she is unknowingly wearing another of Toma's cursed necklaces. Setsu removes the curse with his secret weapon Glutton, a sword that devours magic. Kuroinu, another of Toma's agents, tries to kill Setsu but she is defeated by Levaiye. Kuroinu reveals Toma's goal is to become god and wipe out all living beings, then she teleports away. Free of the curse Maniko and Shiraniko insist on helping Setsu reach Regdom, the beastman capital city, while also hoping to find and rescue Kuroinu. In the past Setsu tutored Roa, the beastman's princess. Now Setsu returns to Regdom and finds Roa is eager to become his student. King Regulus is also glad to see him. 
Learning Toma is behind the war Regulus and Roa are eager to help. General Ruga insists Setsu's five-year absence means he can no longer be trusted. He also claims to be Roa's fiancé and is jealous over Setsu. Regulus announces Setsu will duel Ruga to prove his trustworthiness, plus the winner will marry Roa. Ruga reveals a tattoo he received from a sorcerer that converts willpower into strength. Even transformed into his beast form and with the tattoo Setsu still defeats Ruga. Ruga's tattoo takes his jealousy and mutates him, but his body starts to tear apart from the power. Abruptly, Ruga dies horribly as Toma's astral form manifests from his blood, confirming the tattoo was one of his curses. He is thrilled to see Setsu, revealing his grand plan is to kill everything for Setsu so they could fall in love and live together as gods. He vanishes, leaving Ruga's body behind. Setsu, his party and Roa return to the demon continent to find Toma while Regulus organizes his army to follow as soon as possible. Ten years ago Setsu was summoned as Destinia's hero along with Toma. Setsu was furious at being summoned away from his own life just to solve Destinia's problems. Setsu trained to ensure his own survival and entered a pact with Toma to end the war. Setsu decided to explore the world with Elka, Glaine and Thea while Toma stayed in Destinia studying magic. One day Toma encountered a cursed necklace that offered him the power to return to Japan with Setsu, so he took it and immediately afterward learned Setsu had made friends with the leaders of every nation and negotiated peace. With the war over he told Setsu he could return them to Japan but Setsu chose to stay. With the curse driving him insane at Setsu's rejection Toma attacked, resulting in the explosion that sent Setsu back to Japan as a baby. Toma was thrown far away by the explosion but the curse directed him to a temple where scientists performed torturous human experiments. After destroying it he rescued four surviving test subjects, Kuroinu, Meluer, and two men. Now Setsu has returned Toma plans to form a pantheon of gods from himself, the four test subjects and Setsu. Destinia's army arrives at the demon continent with Setsu's classmates. Elka knows they are unable to stop the fighting without Setsu so Yuhi decides to prevent as many deaths as possible. Many are killed in the first battle, traumatizing many classmates and Yuhi has to stop one killing an injured soldier who can no longer fight back. A hypnotized Alizi attacks with Toma's doll soldiers and Meluer's summon monsters, killing both demons and humans to sow chaos. Meluer hopes to similarly hypnotize Setsu's former teammates, but they destroy her monsters and Elka stabs Meluer in her magic core, destroying her magic power. Meluer doesn't die, revealing as a test subject she was forcibly given extra internal organs to survive fatal injuries, and an extra magic core. Using all her remaining power she summons a giant chimera and fuses herself to it. Ali Z, who still loves Meluer like a sister, breaks her hypnosis and stabs Meluer. With no power left Meluer dies in Ali Z's arms. A male test subject attacks in retaliation for her death. With everyone else exhausted Yuhi bravely decides to fight him alone but Setsu arrives just in time. Regulus army finally sets off to follow Setsu. Yuhi is so happy to see Setsu she nearly kisses him. Setsu is annoyed Elka has been teaching Yuhi masochistic nonsense. The test subject Kajiro is the one who escaped Setsu's attack at Deza's castle and is happy to duel Setsu again. Miniko and Shiraniko locate and duel Kuroinu, revealing their ability beast merge, that fuses them into one body faster and stronger than Kuroinu, who is defeated. Kuroinu reveals she sided with Toma because the scientist's experiments killed all her siblings. The final test subject, Verdos, possesses synthetic iron muscles making him immune to injury. Roa fights him but he reveals his secondary power lets him disintegrate into iron dust then reform into any shape. Roa is injured by iron cannonballs but activates her beast form. She manages to crack Verdo's armor, despite being impaled by spears, and crushes his heart. Amused by his defeat, Verdo's heals Roa's injuries before he collapses. Setsu destroys Kajiro's damage-absorbing armor, and though he doesn't want to, kills him when Kajiro refuses to stop fighting. Toma, sensing all subjects are defeated or dead, appears nearby to finally finish his grand plan. Toma invades Evil Barrow to attack Leviya and Dezas but Setsu quickly arrives. Possessing similar abilities their rematch is so fierce it destroys the throne room, splits the sky and destroys mountains. Toma furiously realizes with the subjects dead he is once again entirely alone while Setsu still has his friends. Going berserk he unleashes his power, but Setsu realizes it is not Setsu's power at all. Toma is overwhelmed and wounded but destroys Setsu's sword. As Toma gloats in victory Setsu traps him in a dimensional barrier and, unleashing his glutton sword, devours his magic until nothing is left. Toma despairs at dying completely alone until he suddenly awakens. Setsu reveals all Glutton 8 was the cursed necklace that tempted Toma into insanity in the first place.
Tomatoma is imprisoned and at Setsu's suggestion is sentenced to spend all his remaining magic sending himself and Setsu's classmates back to Japan to restart their lives as normal humans. Toma agrees but opts to stay behind as a human without magic and to travel the world free of insanity to find ways of making it better. Setsu decides to finally see the world as a tourist with Yuhi, visiting all their friends and seeing every country as they recover from the war. High school student Kamido Kagurazaka is abruptly kidnapped from school by extremely muscular men and deposited at the Saiken School for Girls. He learns from head maid Miyuki Kojo that the school is a well-kept secret academy for the daughters of extremely wealthy families. However, due to being cut off from the realities of the outside world, many of their students become antisocial shut-ins upon graduation. Kamido has been selected as the school's first-ever gay male student or showman sample to remedy this. However, there is a problem, not only is Kamido not gay, he has a fetish for women's thighs. Therefore, to preserve the purity of the female students, Kamido must either masquerade as a gay man with a muscle fetish or face the wrath of head maid Miyuki and her giant scissors. Upon entering the classroom, Kamido meets trendy student Reiko Arasugawa, an extremely naive and antisocial student Aika Tenkabashi with whom he forms the first, commoners club. Kamido is abruptly awoken from sleep by Miyuki, who professes her wish that he had never woken up. Many of the girls in his class are extremely impressed with his commoner ways, including cell phones, handheld games, athletic abilities, and commoner food, i.e. ramen. During a welcoming party in his honor Kamido manages to waltz with Reiko without embarrassing himself. Aika is introduced to manga for the first time and falls for Kamido's prank, where she becomes convinced she has the ability to freeze time, during which she not only flashes Kamido her panties but almost kisses him. Later, following a naked accident in the shower, Reiko becomes convinced she must now marry Kamido, an idea she finds most appealing. Kamido learns that his parents had been heavily bribed to allow him to attend Saiken. He later stumbles upon youthful-looking student Hakua Shiodome who strips naked while scribbling scientific notes on a statue. Following a ramen meal in his room, Hakua begins to strip once again, where Aika gets the wrong idea. Kamido returns Hakua to her laboratory, where he learns not only is Hakua as old as he is, she is a super genius and is now very attached to him, to the delight of her maids. Kamido meets the entomophobic katana-wielding martial artist Karen Jinryo who, through a misunderstanding, is defeated by Kamido in a naked duel. She swears loyalty as his slave until she becomes strong enough to kill him and joins the commoners club, where she becomes strangely interested in Hakua and the idea of selfies. Reiko invites Kamido to a tea party in her room, but he declines as he already had plans with Aika. This later causes Reiko to uncharacteristically shout at her friends, upsetting them. Meanwhile, Kamido helps Aika plan a commoners party so Aika can make friends. Hakua helps by providing free cell phones she helped design so everyone in the class can text each other. However, on learning of Reiko's plight, Aika secretly allows Reiko to host the party to apologize to her friends. However, this later upsets Reiko, who argues with Aika about her antisocial behavior. Reiko and Hakua officially join the commoners club. Miyuki is not impressed to find four girls in Kamido's room, and Kamido has to act quickly to avoid the giant scissors. Kamido's childhood friend, selfish teen idol Eri Haney, who originally lied about Kamido's sexual preferences, angrily wonders where Kamido has vanished to. Kamido wakes up to find Hakua asleep naked in his bed. While teaching her how to cook potato cakes, she once again strips naked while scribbling notes on the wall. Following a game of riddles which Hakua is surprisingly bad at, Kamido returns her to her lab, after which Hakua is embarrassed when Kamido sees she has a plushie of him on her bed. Meanwhile, the other girls, jealous of how close Hakua is to Kamido, attempt to become closer to Hakua so she spends less time with Kamido. Later Reiko and Aika read manga together in Kamido's room before an accident with a soft drink that requires them to strip down to their underwear. A fight breaks out just in time for Kamido to witness the two girls on his bed together in their underwear. He quickly flees with both girls, who desperately try to clear up the misunderstanding. To help their students get used to commoner life, Saiken takes everybody to the specially built showman land that contains a fake commoner city street complete with shops and restaurants where the girls can learn such things as crossing the road and ordering food at a counter. Despite Kamido noticing numerous things wrong with the fake setting, he uses it as another chance for Aika to become popular. Elsewhere, Hakua is upset to learn Kamido has gone on the trip and cannot spend the day with her. While still on the school trip, Aika has become extremely popular due to her knowledge of commoner culture. Meanwhile, Kamido, realizing Karen is secretly afraid of his fighting skills, manages to convince her to try on some revealing clothes she secretly likes. Karen is shocked to learn Kamido finds her attractive. Reiko and Aika become closer as friends. The next day, Kamido is again awoken by Miyuki, 
who wishes he had not woken up. Kamido attends an outdoor bath only to realize Aika and her new friends also wish to bathe. Kamido is forced to hide underwater in a spot Aika finds a little embarrassing. Finding that Kamido has almost drowned, Aika desperately uses the kiss of life, spawning a rumor that they are dating, which Karen is not happy about. Back at Saiken, it is revealed head maid Miyuki has been waking Kamido every morning with a kiss, the real reason she wishes he would stay asleep. Kamido introduces Aika to a fortune-telling game on his cell phone. Now obsessed with such games, the girls compete to find out which of them would be best suited to one day marry Kamido. To everyone's surprise, Karen and Kamido are given a 100% relationship rating. The next day Kamido is once more awoken by Miyuki, who reacts rather aggressively when he asks if his alarm can wake him in the future. Karen invites Kamido to her room on the pretext of repairing a shirt she damages on purpose. Upon entering her room, Karen immediately changes into the revealing clothes Kamido had earlier complimented. As the two become closer, they are almost discovered by the others, forcing both Karen and Kamido to hide in the closet, where Kamido gets closer than he ever dreamed to Karen's thighs. However, they are soon discovered, and Kamido is quick to scramble for an explanation. Kamido introduces the girls to the concept of a maid cafe, which confuses the girls who are used to being surrounded by maids daily. To better understand, the girls dress as maids and attempt to serve Kamido in the role of a cafe customer. It appears to be a success until Reiko attempts to sing. Hakua, depressed over her poor compatibility rating with Kamido, invites him to spend the day with her so he can get to know her better, much to the delight of her maids who come up with numerous ways of bringing the two closer together. However, their plans are brought to a swift end with the arrival of Miyuki. Nevertheless, the other maids celebrate having brought Hakua and Kamido closer together. Kamido's attempt to pull a prank on the naive Aika results in a new fad spreading throughout the entire school, which, due to the students being cut off from popular culture, could last for up to 10 years. Reiko later overhears Kamido on the phone with one of his friends and deduces that Kamido misses being able to socialize with other men and may try to leave Saiken. To remedy this, the girls decide to act more manly so he won't leave. Kamido assures them he never planned to leave, he just misses his old friends. Reiko and Kamido share a pleasant moment together in the classroom. Later both Reiko and Kamido are summoned to a meeting with Reiko's mother, Hoko, and brother, Masiomi who it is revealed has a major sister complex and an immediate dislike of how close Kamido is to Reiko. Reiko's mother informs Reiko that she has arranged for her to marry the son of one of her business associates, and she is to leave Saiken immediately to attend a meeting with her future husband. Kamido and the girls are devastated at the news but feel they cannot interfere. However, they find an ally in Masiomi who, for obvious reasons, also does not want Reiko to get married. He arranges to smuggle them out of the academy grounds in his car to stop the meeting. Kamido, Karen, Aika, Hakua, and Masiomi Masiomi arrive at the meeting place, which is heavily guarded. Karen immediately deals with the front gates and the guards while Masiomi faces off with his martial arts instructor, Takamiya. Kamido, Hakua, and Aika head inside, where Hakua hacks the security system. Kamido and Aika, with help from the maids and the muscle men, make it to the room where the meeting is taking place. Kamido pleads with Reiko's mother to call off the meeting. Inspired by Kamido's words, Reiko refuses to get married, even though she would be disowned from her family and no longer able to attend Saiken. However, as Kamido promises he will take care of her instead, the marriage is called off, and Reiko is allowed to attend Saiken. However, Kamido's promise is taken as a marriage proposal, and he is now engaged to Reiko. Reiko's mother promises to let them get married but only so she can make his life hell every day until he divorces her. Back at Saiken, Kamido apologizes for the misunderstanding, and normal club activities resume as Kamido's bedroom descends once more into chaos. Following the death of his estranged grandmother Sachiko, 19-year-old Hayato inherits her cafe familia, which he intends to turn into a car park. Visiting the house where Sachiko raised him he is shocked to find five girls living there. Uka, Ami, Riho, Shirajuku and Akane are Familia's waitresses and Sachiko's unofficial granddaughters. Uncaring due to his past falling out with Sachiko, Hayato evicts them. They decide to manipulate Hayato by seducing then blackmailing him. Hayato angrily rejects Uka and Ami so Shirajuku is deliberately given alcohol causing her repressed lechery and male body odor fetish to emerge. She jumps on Hayato but Ami, as the girl's self-appointed bodyguard, rescues Shiraguki and beats up Hayato. Developers arrive to discuss demolition work, but when Familia's sign is damaged Hayato regrets falling out with Sachiko and retrieves the sign. Sensing his feelings Uka makes pilaf from Sachiko's recipe. Hayato finally cries over Sachiko's death. Looking at Sachiko's records Hayato realizes Familia is bankrupt from Sachiko paying the girls despite Familia being too small to sustain five employees. Hayato abruptly decides to reopen Familia but warns them unless Familia becomes profitable in one year he will demolish it. Hayato forces the girls to share household chores. When they realize Hayato has seen their 
their underwear by doing laundry they send him to clean familia as punishment. Shirajuku insists Hayato eat with them at mealtimes like family. When Hayato and Uka see each other naked in the bathroom because there was no sign, Ami beats him up even though Uka walked in on him. Hayato practices making coffee but the girls agree his coffee is terrible. Later, the antisocial Akane somehow makes excellent coffee. Despite being annoyed by her, Hayato asks for help. Akane realizes Sachiko was right, he does look cute whilst sulking. Hayato childishly responds she looks cute when she smiles, but she doesn't react and shows him how to make coffee. After Hayato leaves Akane is actually shown to be quite flustered. Hayato is again beaten by Ami, this time for seeing her naked in the bathroom, even though he put up a sign. Hayato takes Riho on courtesy visits to advertise Familia's reopening but Riho scolds him for acting moody, putting people off. Realizing she is right, Hayato promises to do better. Riho rewards him by flashing her panties, making him fall down the stairs. Riho is shown with a shrine fortune predicting she will find love with a co-worker. Hayato and Uka argue constantly so Riho advises Hayato find a solution. Akane advises compliments so he praises Uka several times, but Uka takes it as sarcasm. He later finds Uka in her waitress uniform which he compliments as cute, making Uka smile as she made their uniforms herself. Shirajuku, accidentally drunk again, ruins the moment molesting Hayato. Hayato pays the girl some wages, revealing he has money in the stock market. Ami tries to distract Hayato from discovering she broke his phone and laptop but fails. This prevents Hayato from selling his stocks in a suddenly bankrupt company, wiping out his savings. He punishes Ami for breaking his phone and laptop. Now entirely financially dependent on Familia, Hayato announces the girls will have to rotate shifts so only two work at a time. Familia reopens with multiple satisfied customers, until the arrival of Fuwa, the loan shark who always harassed Sachiko over money she owed. Hayato keeps his temper, even stopping the girls from hitting Fuwa when he insults Sachiko. However, when Fuwa intentionally exposes Shirajuku's panties, Hayato blackmails him and throws him out while their customers applaud and promise to be his witnesses in case Fuwa comes back. Fuwa swears revenge for insulting him. Shirajuku realizes Hayato hasn't changed since they were childhood friends 15 years ago. In order to recover from the decreasing customers at Familia, Hayato decides to open a stall at the Cherry Blossom Festival. Shirajuku suggests cherry liqueur cookies but gets drunk and molests Hayato, who is then punished by Ami. Akane gives Hayato a cookie recipe she and Sachiko developed. They open the stall, but Uka is harassed by Fuwa's grandson and his thugs. The other stall owners drive them away, but Familia's stall is vandalized overnight. Hayato recalls Sachiko had an old food cart which they quickly spruce up into a mobile cafe stall, which is a success thanks to Riho's social media work. The same thugs meet them on the way home and continue harassing them. Fuwa's grandson punches Hayato, who took it on purpose, believing Fuwa's reputation protects him from being arrested by the police. Claiming self-defense under Hayato's orders, Ami beats up the grandson and the thugs. Hayato threatens them further by claiming Uka is a secret murderous gang leader, much to her dismay, so the thugs flee. Hayato recorded the whole conversation about Fuwa's connections to corrupt police officers to prevent further retaliation. Uka is surprised Hayato took the punch on purpose so they wouldn't vandalize Sachiko's food cart. Hayato notices between college and Familia Riho is working too much. Riho is grateful for how Sachiko helped her and wants to make Familia successful. She flashes back to her mother who told her those who don't work hard are worthless. Hayato tells her she should do more things for herself, reminding her of Sachiko and making her think Hayato might actually be reliable. Hayato learns Akane plays in a band on her days off but won't let the girls attend her concerts. By chance Hayato comes across her underground concert concert and finds that despite her usual indifference she is a passionate, talented singer. Akane is embarrassed he saw her sing so he promises to keep her talent secret but is surprised Akane is unwilling to try becoming a professional singer. Akane is further embarrassed Hayato has bought one of her CDs. The next week the girls discuss living together with a man but conclude from his personality Hayato won't try to seduce them. They wonder what Hayato plans to do when the year is over. Akane claims she wouldn't mind marrying Hayato, shocking the girls, then claims she was joking. Riho notices Hayato Hayato smiles whenever Shirajuku praises him, and Shirajuku is envious when Hayato pats Riho's head. Shirajuku is outraged Hayato plans to change Sachiko's old menu, leading to a taste test, a Sachiko sandwich against a new menu sandwich made by Riho. Aware the girl's real motive isn't the menu, Hayato claims he is full and doesn't try either sandwich. Ami becomes a perfect employee, worrying everybody. Akane suspects it is because Ami recently lost a karate match. Ami confirms her coach even advised her not to try due to her opponent's strength. Hayato rejects this, 
pointing out Ami just needs to learn more moves. Ami recovers but breaks Hayato's new laptop, followed by Uka breaking his phone. After the girls start acting strangely, Hayato realizes that despite appearances they are just employees, not his family, and almost tells them so, only to find they had planned a party to celebrate Familia's two-month anniversary. Hayato realizes they are his family after all. Akane receives a phone call from her mother that upsets her. From Akane's behavior, Hayato deduces she is planning to quit and move out due to her mother. Akane is grateful for Hayato's help, jokingly offering a breast squeeze as repayment, but Hayato asks her for a date instead. The girls discover the secret date and are suspicious. Akane realizes the date is Hayato's way of asking her to share her problem. She eventually reveals her family owns a trading company. Since her father died she is sole heir, so her mother has chosen a fiancé for her and is pressuring her to have children. Hayato deduces from the lousy coffee she just made Akane doesn't want to go. The girls agree she can't leave so Akane asks Hayato to help her. They meet Akane's mother, but she is unable to speak her mind, so Hayato gives her a harsh scolding that she needs to stop making excuses and start standing up for herself. With that, Akane gains the courage to defy her mother. She relents and tells Akane can live as she pleases and seems to be familiar with Hayato's family name Kasakabe. The other girls are relieved Akane is staying. As she leaves, her mother cheerfully points out if Akane wants to marry Hayato she will need to defeat the other girls first, much to her embarrassment as she denies her claim. In private, Akane thanks Hayato for his help by hugging him and promising to make his coffee the rest of his life. An embarrassed Hayato warns her not to make fun of him and walks away. Delighted, she confirms she has a crush on him. After paying their wages Hayato reveals his plan to open a Familia beach hut, though this would involve the girls giving up their summer break in order to work and the hut costs for months profits to build. Akane rejoins her band mates to start singing again. The girls agree to work the summer and immediately discuss whether to wear beach uniforms or bikinis, depending on which one flusters Hayato more, until Hayato insists on shorts and vests. Shirajuku gets drunk touching alcohol cleaning wipes and molests Hayato half-naked. Akane changes her band name like Hayato had suggested, making the others worry she has become a serious rival for Hayato's affections. Shirajuku creates a watermelon parfait as the hut's signature item, followed by a photo shoot that goes viral due to Ami wearing a bizarre mask. On the opening day, Riho sees Akane talking with Hayato instead of working and becomes angry at them before fainting from overwork and heatstroke. Hayato scolds her for worrying him again, which actually makes her feel less jealous, though she throws a tantrum when Hayato refused to apologize to Akane for her. Akane overhears this anyway and smiles. Riho yells at Hayato when bikini girls flirt with him. Akane teaches Uka to make coffee, though it doesn't go well. Hayato learns Shirajuku has a guaranteed chef career after college and wonders why she bothers to work at a coffee shop. Fuwa's grandson and thugs visit the hut and hassle Riho, so Hayato sends Ami to scare them away. Riho decides to apology for yelling but when she sees more bikini girls flirting with him she yells again. Akane tells Hayato her next song is about first love. Before he gets her hint Ami pulls him into the ocean as a prank. Akane teaches Ami to make coffee and she does better than Uka. Hayato has to force Riho to take a break so she won't faint again. A news reporter accidentally reveals Riho's past as a child actress upsetting her. It is revealed Riho's mother overworked her, leading Riho's father to divorce her over concerns for Riho's health, which Riho never recovered from. Hayato assures her familia's success doesn't matter if it risks her health, so she agrees to relax more and cries in Hayato's arms. It turns out the girls knew about her past anyway but didn't think it was important since to them she is just Riho, not child actress Riho. Uka's twin sister Kika tracks her to familia and is angry Uka only has part-time employment and a bizarre living arrangement. She proceeds to insult the girls, Hayato and Familia as unsuitable for their respectable Makazawa family, so Uka slaps her. Kika leaves angry. Uka explains her family all graduated from Tokyo University for generations, but she couldn't handle the pressure from their parents and left to study fashion. Kika observes everyone from a distance while Uka remembers Kika agreed to attend university so their parents would let her study fashion. Hayato points out Kika continuing to hang around can only mean she is worried about Uka, so he gives her the day off to talk to her. Kika reveals she wanted to go to university, so Uka acting like she forced her to go and then distancing herself is infuriating. Uka realizes Kika misses her and they reconcile. Kika reveals Hayato impressed her, he was the only one not to mistake her for Uka. Later, Uka thanks Hayato for his help and asks how he knew Kika wasn't her when even their parents still mix them up. Hayato points out Kika is left-handed, but she had also shouted at Ami which Uka would never do as she is too kind-hearted. Uka becomes unexpectedly flustered. Akane surprised 
surprises Hayato by asking about his romantic future. Embarrassed, Hayato claims he won't think about it until he decides Familia's future. Akane accepts he is not yet ready to accept or reject her confession. This is all overheard by Shirajuku. The house bathtub breaks so they must bathe at a bathhouse while Hayato agrees to install a new bath and toilet. Akane informs Riho she confessed to Hayato at the beach, so if she loves Hayato as well she needs to let him know soon. Riho finally confesses to Hayato but instantly claims to be joking. Hayato is uncomfortable by this and repeats himself that he won't think about romance until Familia's future is decided. Riho accepts this, but the next day loses her temper as Akane now openly flirts with Hayato. Their rivalry is noticed by customers as they argue over Hayato. Ami steps in to calm them down and force them both to stop fighting. Akane admits she provoked Riho on purpose so she could be honest about her feelings as she tends to keep them bottled up. Riho confirms her statement and apologizes for losing her temper. They both agree to be civilized rivals. Hayato witnessed this and runs off confused, afraid he did something wrong. Despite the misunderstanding, Akane and Riho both swear to tell Hayato how they really feel for him. That night, Hayato sees Shirajuku in Sachiko's room. Hayato decides to create another new menu item. Akane and Riho notice Hayato doesn't trust either of them, given their recent rivalry behavior. Shirajuku is annoyed when Hayato casually mentions her moving out soon to get a real job, so she abruptly confesses to him as well. Thankfully she was just drunk on kitchen disinfectant and passes out in her underwear. Hayato hears a rumor about Sachiko and finally demands to know why he saw Shirajuku in her room late at night. Shirajuku's flashback shows Sachiko was once a three Michelin star chef in Spain who mentored Shirajuku's father, which is how Shirajuku first met Hayato as children. Sachiko never wanted Hayato to know she had to quit being a chef to raise him. Hayato blames himself for ruining Sachiko's life, but Shirajuku assures him Sachiko never once regretted choosing to raise him. Hayato decides he simply can't let Familia fail. The other girls, all eavesdropping, tearfully agree to do whatever it takes to make Familia thrive, though their emotional outbursts only cause Hayato to yell in frustration. A flash forward shows an older Hayato, still working at at Familia, but now with his teenage daughter, though which of the five girls he ended up marrying is left a mystery. As Hayato and the girls are having a picnic, a drunken Shirajuku tells everyone that she loves Hayato, much to their shock, especially to Akane and Riho as they have another rival in their hands to win Hayato's heart. On the day of his middle school graduation, Mirai Kakahashi loses the will to live and decides to commit suicide by jumping off a tower block. However, his life is suddenly spared by special rank angel Nas, who is already aware that Mirai's parents and younger brother Akira died in a car accident before Mirai was taken in by his abusive aunt and uncle. Nas offers Mirai the hope of freedom with wings and the hope of love with arrows as angel tools, though Mirai initially rejects the offer until he uses his wings. After Nas shockingly reveals that Mirai's parents and Akira were murdered by Mirai's aunt and uncle, Mirai later shoots his red arrow at his aunt in order to verify the greedy truth. Mirai accidentally compels his aunt to stab herself to death right in front his uncle. Three days later, Mirai tells Nas that he wants ordinary happiness desiring enough money to improve his standard of living. Suggesting that Mirai could shoot his white arrow at his uncle in order to ensure a painless death, Nas explains that there are currently 13 god candidates all competing to become the successor and each having their own angel. Mirai wants to enroll in high school. After the news reports that failed comedian Tanma Rodriguez is polyamorous, Mirai realizes that Tanma is a god candidate who shot his red arrow at multiple women. In a parking garage, masked superhero Metropolitan who is also a god candidate, shoots his white arrow at Tanma inside a limo. Second rank angel Luda is out of the running as he carries Tanma to the celestial realm, home to the angels. After shooting his red arrow in order to have his uncle surrender to the police, Mirai is shocked upon witnessing a public broadcast of a bank robbery, where Metropolitan shoots his red arrows to halt the riot police before shooting his red and white arrows to thwart and kill two bank robbers. Metropolitan blatantly proclaims that he plans to kill the other god candidates by any means necessary, having already killed one of them. Upon returning home, a doubtful Mirai starts to understand his role as a god candidate and the ranks of the angels. Despite all the warnings, Mirai still decides to attend his first day of class at high school while advising Nas to stay home. After seeing the second rank angel revel flying above the high school, Mirai is shot with a red arrow from behind by his childhood friend and classmate Saki Hanakego. As Mirai meets up with Saki in her bedroom, Revel confirms that Mirai is a god candidate and that Nas is a special rank angel. After teaching Mirai to link with Saki before using his wings, Revel explains that Metropolitan poses as a tabloid superhero and plans to kill the other god candidates. As Mirai is willing to sacrifice himself in order to protect Saki, Nas luckily finds him and explains that angel tools can be taken or transferred if a god candidate dies. Meanwhile, Metropolitan speaks with his special rank angel Miza 
who believes that the other god candidates are afraid of being killed. After 33 days, the effects of Saki's red arrow wears off on Mirai, who remains in love with Saki. Metropolitan publicly announces that he wants to establish a peaceful alliance by inviting the other god candidates at a ballpark called the Jinbo Stadium. Mirai and Saki arrive at the Jinbo Stadium on high alert as Metropolitan makes a dramatic entrance on the pitcher's mound. Metro Blue and Metro Yellow, two god candidates, suddenly arrive at the Jinbo Stadium and challenge Metropolitan to a duel. In the past, Shogo Hatakayama and Saburo Tabuchi failed their college entrance exam and attempted to commit suicide via drug overdose. After being saved by first rank angels Emika and Egura, Shogo and Saburo assumed the identities of Metro Blue and Metro Yellow. In the present, the real Metropolitan briefly appears on the Jumbotron, explaining that the fake Metropolitan is an ordinary human shot with a red arrow. A young girl named Chio Nakayama, another god candidate, appears with second rank angel Jamie and asks to join Shogo and Saburo. However, the real Metropolitan swiftly shoots his red arrow at Chio before leaving again. Meanwhile, Mirai and Saki sit idly by while struggling to act upon the situation. Switching places with the fake Metropolitan after bribing two cosplayers named Metro Pink and Metro Green as pawns for distraction, the real Metropolitan then shoots his white arrow at Shogo and his red arrow at Saburo. After handcuffing Saburo and Chio together to the stands, Metropolitan shoots his white arrow at Saburo, making Chio rather defenseless. Just when Metropolitan shoots his white arrow at Chio, Nas arrives at the scene and urges the remaining god candidates to leave the Jinbo Stadium with the ordinary humans. Mirai and Saki head back to Saki's bedroom during a downpour. Revel knows that Metropolitan is capable of outsmarting the police, while Nas deduces that Mirai will not gain happiness from killing Metropolitan. Nanato Mukato, another god candidate, suddenly appears from outside the window. He suffers from terminal cancer, having previously met first-rank Angel Barrett in a hospital. Furthermore, he provided for his pregnant wife Aya and daughter Nanaka after shooting his red arrows at rich people, and he sought to find the other god candidates at the Jinbo Stadium after shooting his red arrows at detectives. Mirai and Saki agree to form an alliance with Nanato, revealed as a product planner for an apparel company. The next day, Kanade Yuryu, implied to be Metropolitan, and his classmate Mizukiyo Minamikawa discuss their wishes after class while watching Mizukiyo's crush Sayuri during archery practice. Kanade returns to his home, where he brings flowers to his deceased younger sister Rei Yuryu, who is being kept in a freeze chamber. The news reports that middle schoolgirl and amateur teen model Mimimai Masurin Yamada has escaped juvenile detention after being convicted as a serial killer two years ago. Mirai, Saki and Nanato deduce that Metropolitan shot his red arrow at Masurin before lending her a red arrow and wings so she could escape and target other female victims. Metropolitan has acquired three red arrows and three wings from the previously eliminated god candidates. Nanato states that the best option for Mirai is to kill Metropolitan with a white arrow, though Mirai may not have the courage to do this. The news later reports that the body of middle schoolgirl Hikari Yaishur was discovered on the rooftop of the Grand Tower, where her common carotid artery and both wrists were slashed by a sharp blade. Realizing that Masurin is located hovering above the Grand Tower, Nanato equips Mirai with a red motorsport costume, while Saki holds down the fort in her bedroom. If Metropolitan does not show up at the Grand Tower, then Nanato will have no choice but to kill Masurin. Nanato confronts Masurin on the rooftop of the Grand Tower, while Mirai is on standby at a nearby rooftop. Just as Nanato realizes that he fell right into a trap, Metropolitan remotely detonates the rooftop of the Grand Tower, killing Masurin. Mirai luckily saves Nanato from plummeting to the ground. Metropolitan appears from the rising smoke behind Mirai who finally confronts Metropolitan for his sinister methods of eliminating the competition by sacrificing ordinary humans. Despite Metropolitan unveiling that he has planted a second bomb in another location, Nanato calls this bluff and proceeds to stop Metropolitan. As Metropolitan prepares to shoot a white arrow at Nanato, Mirai deflects it with a red arrow. Metropolitan is then recklessly attacked by Mirai with his red arrow, though Mirai is forced to dodge Metropolitan with his white arrow at high speeds. Nanato tries to restrain Metropolitan with firearms, though Mirai Mirai holds back from shooting his red arrow after seeing a glimpse of Metropolitan's face. Metropolitan then quickly evades the area. Returning to Saki's bedroom, Mirai admits to Saki and Nanato of being a coward since he is not cut out for battle, though he desires to have a normal life instead of being a god candidate. Nanato learns that Saki attempted to commit suicide by drowning at sea prior to meeting Revel. Meanwhile, Mizukiyo speculates that Kanade is really Metropolitan. Later at night, Saki invites Mirai to sleep with her in bed. Saki admits that she wants to die after 
viewing Mirai as her bodyguard rather than her ally, recalling when Mirai gave her a spotted yellow ladybug on a four-leaf clover to symbolize their everlasting friendship since childhood, Saki felt ashamed that she used to bully Mirai after his parents died. She also witnessed him jumping off the tower block on the day of the middle school graduation which compelled her to drown herself at sea. After Saki requests Mirai to kill her, he takes her to the sky convincing her to regain her will to live. The next day, Saki has a new attitude as she tells Mirai and Nanato that their meeting place will be relocated inside a church instead of her bedroom. Barrett then informs Saki about the four methods on how to acquire wings involving a previously eliminated god candidate, though a safer option is if Revel could be promoted as a first-rank angel. A sword wielder named Hajime Sokotani, another god candidate, kills a detective who was previously shot with a red arrow. At the church, Nanato equips Saki with a yellow motorsport costume. After reclaiming his red arrow, Nanato deduces that the detective is dead. Approaching Nanato's house, Mirai briefly encounters Hajime, while Nanato eventually finds out that Aya and Nanaka have been abducted. In the past, Hajime was poor and ugly during childhood. When his mother committed suicide, by hanging, Hajime nearly followed suit until meeting first-rank angel Balta. Hajime became obsessed with Metropolitan, who is his polar opposite. Despite obtaining wealth before getting cosmetic facial surgery and a new hairdo, he still had poor communication skills. When the news reported the incident at the Grand Tower, Hajime eventually learned of Kanade's identity as Metropolitan, wishing to become his loyal subordinate. At a dance studio, Hajime remotely communicated with Kanade who implored Hajime to capture another god candidate. In the present, Nanato is contacted by Kanade, who says that Aya and Nanaka are being held hostage at the abandoned Minamino Amusement Park. Mirai and Nanato head towards Minamino Amusement Park, while Saki stays behind at the church. Intent on rescuing Aya and Nanaka, Nanato walks inside a house of mirrors, though this a trap set by Hajime. After being surrounded by Metropolitan and Hajime, Mirai willingly enters the house of mirrors, instructing Nanato that they must use their wings to fly inside the house of mirrors while carrying Aya and Nanaka in order to avoid being seen from the outside. As Metropolitan leaves Hajime to finish the job, Mirai and Nanato try to trick Hajime into thinking that they managed to escape without being seen. At the church, Saki sees herself as useless since she cannot fight without wings. Upon reflecting his own powerlessness, Revel sheds tears for the first time. Due to this, Revel is promoted as a first-rank angel, and Saki is granted her own wings. As Saki arrives at Minamino Amusement Park, she shoots her red arrow at Hajime, while Mirai and Nanato are unaware of what is happening outside. Hajime experiences love for the first time as he struggles with his loyalty towards Metropolitan. Saki compels Hajime to rescue her friends from the House of Mirrors. Defying Metropolitan's orders, Hajime finally values human life and punctures the glass dome. Metropolitan suddenly arrives with his underlings, former military servant Ruji Bakamatsu, pharmaceutical researcher Fuyuko Kohinata, and masked boy Susumu Yudo. Hajime protects Saki, while Mirai and Nanato break through the glass dome with Aya and Nanaka in tow. Aya and Nanaka are each taken back to the church by Saki, who soon learns that Hajime would kill anyone for her. Mirai, Saki and Nanato shoot red arrows at each other as a bidding strategy. After Hajime dodges Ruji's gunfire, Mirai and Saki restrain Ruji, allowing Hajime to cut off Ruji's right arm. As Fuyuko threatens to release an airborne virus capable of killing millions of people, Metropolitan forces Mirai to be the first test subject for an untested drug capable of melting someone. Mirai approach Fuyuko on the Ferris wheel, while Saki, Nanato and Hajime are helpless to stop Mirai. As Fuyuko prepares to inject Mirai with the untested drug, Mirai grabs Fuyuko by the hand before shooting a white arrow at the airborne virus moments after it is released. Now having the best opportunity to kill Fuyuko with his white arrow, Mirai internally struggles with achieving happiness by attempting murder. A depleted Nanato tries tries to aim a rifle at Metropolitan as a distraction. Metropolitan shoots his white arrow while Fuyuko releases three syringes containing the untested drug, both aimed at Mirai. Saki shields Mirai, which redirects the white arrow back to Metropolitan's possession. After severing two syringes, Hajime is consequently pierced by the third syringe, though he still manages to kill Fuyuko with his sword before melting to death. As Mirai and Saki mourns the death of Hajime, Metropolitan scoffs at the fact that Hajime lived an insignificant life similar to a cockroach. Susumu chickens out of the battle after having witnessed everything, while Nanato is down for the count. Believing that Metropolitan is lower than a cockroach, Mirai preserves his happiness by planning to only shoot red arrows at Metropolitan.
Agreeing to mutual combat on the ground, Mirai is armed with red arrows and Metropolitan is armed with white arrows as they gradually move closer to each other while taking turns shooting and dodging. As their duel unfolds, Metropolitan reflects his own personal values. In the past, Kanade displayed his affection for Rei by decorating her bedroom with flowers and aiding her in the tennis court due to their socioeconomic status. Rei was invited to go on a date with a boy, but a possessive Kanade begged Rei to stay. Rei stumbled and fell off the balcony, suffering a cerebral contusion from hitting her head on a stone before being cushioned by the flowers. After keeping Ri's corpse in a freeze chamber, Kanade met Maiza for the first time. In the present, Susumu secretly exposes the duel to the public via live streaming, though the location remains censored. Metropolitan proclaims that he will eliminate poverty and inequality if he becomes the successor, though this means that the poor and ugly will be killed. As Mirai and Metropolitan inch even closer, Metropolitan prepares to make an underhanded move. Initially believing that he is not fighting the real Metropolitan, Mirai has a sense of clarity when Metropolitan briefly shows his face as Kanade. Mirai suddenly charges with his red arrow at Metropolitan, but it is revealed that Metropolitan was previously shot with a red arrow by someone else. In order to prevent Metropolitan from shooting his white arrow, Mirai uses his wings to block Metropolitan's field of vision and grabs onto Metropolitan's right hand. Instead, Metropolitan uses his left hand to stab Mirai but Mirai's red motorsport costume proves to be impenetrable. Saki then grabs onto Metropolitan's left hand, allowing Mirai and Saki to link together while binding Metropolitan. Making peace with himself as being a hero, Nanato uses his remaining strength to walk with his rifle towards Metropolitan, who confesses that he has been fighting in honor of Rei. As Nanato pulls the trigger, Metropolitan is finally shot to death, having nowhere to run or hide. Mirai and Saki take Nanato to the hospital, where Nanato eventually succumbs to his terminal cancer. Before carrying Nanato to the celestial realm, Barrett gives Nanato's red arrow and wings to Saki. Engaged detectives Masaya Hoshi and Manami Yumiki conduct an investigation on the identities of the remaining god candidates after the death of Kanade. Mirai and Saki are unaware that Kanade was previously shot with a red arrow by Susumu who compelled Kanade to target Mirai in the first place. After reviewing that Saki has three red arrows and three wings, Mirai also racks his brain over which of the other four remaining god candidates took Kanade's acquired four wings, four red arrows and one white arrow. Mirai and Saki eat curry for breakfast. The six remaining angels have a meeting since half of the god candidates have been eliminated. While eating egg sandwiches for lunch, Mirai and Saki learn that Susumu publicly exposed himself as a god candidate and admitted to broadcasting Metropolitan's defeat. After Explaining the role of the god candidates, Susumu says that he lived a lonely life and attempted to overdose on sleeping pills prior to meeting first rank angel Penema. Having felt exhilarated after witnessing the duel between Mirai and Metropolitan at Minamino Amusement Park, Susumu encourages the public to track down the remaining god candidates and vote for whoever should become the successor. Susumu publicly nominates Mirai to become the successor. On a tropical island, a god candidate named Yuri Temari learns from her second rank angel Yazali that the potential successor might make the God candidates cease to exist. Still affected by Mirai's previously shot red arrow, Saki wishes to run away with Mirai, though he reassures her that their real identities will not be discovered since they were only seen in their motorsport costumes. Later on, Masaya locates Mirai, though Saki accidentally shoots her red arrow at Manami. Masaya wishes to protect instead of capture Mirai and Saki, while Manami had figured out their real identities. Mirai and Saki are brought to Masaya and Manami's apartment and are given secure smartphones, eventually convincing Mirai and Saki to collaborate with Masaya and Manami. After Masaya and Manami begin to understand the role of the god candidates, it is revealed that Yuri has been already captured. Saki also equips Manami with wings and a red arrow. They look further into Mizukiyo, who recently started dating Sayuri shortly after Kanade's death. Mirai and Saki confront Mizukiyo in a park, in which Mirai shoots his red arrow at Mizukiyo, compelling Mizukiyo to be an ally. After Mirai prevents Shuji Nakami, another god candidate, from compelling his older brother Osamu to commit suicide in their bedroom, Mizukiyo admits that he lied about being a god candidate after first rank angel Aguro appears behind Shuji. Having a strong belief in euthanasia, Shuji gradually compelled his hospitalized grandfather, divorced father and cheating mother to die peacefully after shooting his red arrow at each of them. After Mizukiyo puts in his two cents by explaining his prior friendship with Kanade, a somewhat convinced Shuji refrains from compelling Osamu to commit suicide. Mirai, Saki and Mizukiyo bring Shuji and Osamu to Masaya and Manami's apartment. There is still one 
God candidate yet to be identified. Shuji says that people are the result of worldly passions fueled by desire, though Masaya says that desires make people happy. After making a public appearance in their motorsport costumes, Mirai and Saki meet with Susumu in the atmosphere, persuading him to help them identify the last God candidate. Meanwhile, Revel relays this information to Yuri, who is being held in protective custody. With some discreet help from Masaya and Manami, Yuri manages to escape from being held in protective custody. In the woods, Susumi transfers wings to Yuri, who goes with Mirai and Saki to Masaya and Manami's apartment. Agaro explains the powerful role of the successor, who will reside in the celestial realm with the angels and watch over the humans on Earth. Disagreeing with Shuji's idealism of encouraging suicide, Mirai believes in providing hope instead. Susumu remotely suggests to vote for whoever should become the successor, and the majority decide to vote for Shuji. Elsewhere, Professor Emeritus Gaku Yanida, another god candidate, talks to special rank angel Muni about eating his final dinner while reflecting that his despair for humanity is paradoxically his aspiration for humanity. Mizukio and Osamu stay with Masaya and Manami. Mirai, Saki, Susumu, Yuri and Shuji make a public appearance in Yurikucho, where they are met by Muni. However, Gaku will not show himself until the others share their thoughts with Muni on whoever should become the successor. When military helicopters approach Mirai, Saki, Susumu, Yuri and Shuji, Gaku contacts Prime Minister Suzuki, urging him to refrain from attacking the other god candidates. Suzuki then orders the military helicopters to withdraw. Each of them broadcast their worldview in becoming the successor. This includes euthanasia for Shuji, hedonism for Yuri, leisure for Susumu, happiness for Saki and Nixon for Mirai. As Mirai, Saki, Susumu, Yuri and Shuji regroup back at Yurikucho, Gaku finally shows himself as the last god candidate. Theorizing that humanity invented the concept of a divine entity, Gaku reveals that he has previously written about denying the existence of spirits and souls, which cannot be proven through scientific observation. Proclaiming that the age of prayers has now come to an end, Gaku publicly debunks the concept of a divine entity, referring to it as a fading creature. Meanwhile, military snipers have targeted the six remaining god candidates from the shadows. After Gaku believes that humanity would be better off without a successor, Shuji opts to side with Gaku. Despite this, a determined Mirai still decides that he wants to become the successor. One of the military snipers successfully hit Susumu, causing the others to flee from the scene. Gaka shoots his white arrow at Susumu, taking Susumu's acquired arrows and wings while Shuji watches in awe. Mirai, Saki and Yuri retreat back to Masaya and Manami's apartment. For his safety, Gaku shoots his red arrow at Shuji. After Masaya learns that Gaku is the last god candidate, Manami shoots her red arrow at Masaya. Mirai, Saki and Yuri are brought by Masaya and Manami to an emergency shelter. Masaya reveals that Gaku has won Nobel Prizes in physics and in literature after choosing to become a high school dropout in order to study on his own and avoid interpersonal relationships. Meanwhile, Shuji learns that Gaku agreed to become a god candidate so that he would possibly experience the afterlife. Gaku recalls that he first met Muni after he attempted to commit suicide via drug overdose due to the overwhelming publicity of his scientific research. Placed in a tough situation, Gaku agrees to lend a white arrow to Shuji after Agaro divulges that Nas has the ability to directly interact with Mirai. The public greatly prefers Gaku over Yuri as the successor. The effects of Saki's red arrows wear off on Masaya and Manami. As per Gaku's request, Suzuki publicly announces that the new national stadium will be a secure venue for the god candidates to hold a meeting in five days. Mirai, Saki and Yuri discuss that now only 10% of the world population still believe in a divine entity. At night, Mizukio and Sayuri witness Mirai and Saki using their wings in the sky, though perceived as shooting stars. Gaku and Shuji enjoy a Shadowbriand during their feast with Suzuki. At sunrise, Mirai and Saki go on the rooftop of the tower block, where Saki confesses her love to Mirai. On the day of the meeting, Mirai, Saki, Yuri, Masaya and Manami arrive at the new national stadium, where Gaku and Shuji are waiting. Masaya tries to reason with Gaku, who reveals that he overcame his anthropophobia despite his arrogance. Thanks to an experiment previously conducted on suicidal people deep in the woods, Gaku has figured out a way so that the five remaining god candidates would die almost simultaneously without a successor being chosen. Believing that humans should decide how humanity ends, Gaku explains that all of humanity would lose the will to live due to the concept of time. With Masaya acting as a witness, Mirai and Gaku have a private conversation, while Saki, Yuri, Manami and Shuji temporarily leave the new national stadium. Mirai firmly desires to preserve happiness by saving human lives. This spurs mixed reactions from the public. Mirai gains the resolve to aim his white arrow at Gaku, while Saki, Yuri and Manami find themselves held captive by Shuji, 
who aims his white arrow at Saki. As Mirai realizes that humanity would face extinction due to scientific progress, Gaku explains that the future is already predetermined in the past, though Mirai believes that the future is the product of the present. After 28 seconds have passed, Mirai decides that he will not become the successor. Gaku calls out Mirai for being willing to forsake millions of lives in order to save Saki, though Mirai notes that Saki is the most important person to him. After another 28 seconds have passed, Mirai chooses to sacrifice himself for Saki as Gaku shoots a white arrow at Mirai. Nas suddenly swoops in and saves Mirai from dying, though she is consequently demoted as a second-rank angel, while Masaya catches Mirai from plummeting to the ground. Meanwhile, Saki, Yuri and Manami deduce that Shuji may not have the resolve to kill someone who wants to live. When Masaya finally puts down Mirai on the ground, Gaku shoots his white arrow at Mirai, who is then saved by the timely arrival of Saki. Manami returns with Shuji at the new national stadium, but Yuri fails to initiate a sneak attack when Nas swoops in to save Gaku. Nas is surprisingly promoted as a special rank angel. It is revealed that Shuji previously released Saki, Yuri and Manami before lending his white arrow to Yuri. Although Gaku thinks that he is not a genius, the public says otherwise. As it is concluded that happiness can only be achieved through others, Gaku prepares to commit suicide. However, it is unanimous decided that Shuji will become the successor, thus ending the selection process. Upon consent, the memories of Masaya, Manami and Yuri are erased, while the memories of Mirai, Saki and Gaku are retained. Ascending into the celestial realm, where time moves slower than on Earth, Shuji realizes that God is beginning to fuse with him. Yuri is shown to be the assistant of Gaku, who is analyzing the effects of the red arrow that Shuji left behind, but to no avail. Deciding to run a flower shop that sells four-leaf clovers, Mirai and Saki notably become an engaged couple before getting married at the church. Nas tells Shuji that the other angels are worried about him. Six years have passed on earth, and the handful of people that Shuji knew are living happy lives. However, Shuji has an epiphany after seeing so many people greatly divided in socio-economic status. Shuji then shoots himself with a white arrow. This causes the celestial realm and everything in it to gradually vanish. All living beings on earth also gradually vanish, as Mirai and Saki accept their fate and die happily together. With earth left as a barren wasteland, an endless number of unknown life forms from outer space primarily wonder if they should seed another god, though they ultimately declare that everyone desires death. Genius sorcerer Gaius laments that with the three magical crests he was born with, creation, power, and rapid firing, he cannot grow any stronger, so he decides to reincarnate in the future. Reborn 5,000 years later as Matthias Hildesheimer he gains the fourth crest close combat, regarded in this time as the weakest crest. Deciding to join Second Royal Academy Matthias travels to the city where he discovers magical knowledge has drastically decreased. He meets fellow Academy hopefuls Luri and Alma and enchants a magical sword for Luri, who develops a crush on him. After defeating Knight Captain Guile with the sword and showing his advanced combat magic Matthias is accepted into the Academy with Luri and Alma. Headmaster Edward asks him to teach the other students his wordless casting, the ability to cast spells without speaking, a skill normally rejected in academic circles, in time for the next Inter Academy competition. At the competition against the prestigious First Academy Matthias realizes one of their students, Devi Lise, is a demon and defeats it after exposing it to the audience. He realizes the decline of magical knowledge and wordless casting must have been caused by demons to make humanity weaker after he himself almost drove demons extinct 5,000 years ago. The king personally thanks Matthias for defeating a demon, even though to Matthias it was was barely a challenge. For his reward Matthias requests access to the kingdom's dungeons. The king reveals the most powerful sorcerers of the kingdom vanished after the demon's defeat, causing Matthias to realize they must have been demons who infiltrated human society to destabilize it. Now unable to keep hiding Matthias reasons they will assemble armies to attack the kingdom. He thus gains the king's permission to continue teaching wordless casting while gathering materials necessary to cast a magical barrier of protection over the city. To gather resources Matthias decides to raid a dungeon with Luri and Alma to increase their combat power teaching Alma to use a bow and Luri how to craft and enchant weapons and armor. After reaching floor 10 and increasing their levels Matthias descends to a much deeper floor alone to gather adamantite for the barrier. While there he also defeats a boss monster, his magical power coming to the attention of several demons. Matthias learns from Luri and Alma that his former identity as Gaius is worshipped as a god of magic. After selling the boss monster's magi stone, which Matthias considers too small for the barrier but everyone else considers big enough to be a national treasure, he splits the money 
equally with Luri and Alma. Two demons appear in the city to avenge the death of Devilis. Luri and Alma distract the weaker demon, allowing Matthias to defeat the stronger demon by himself. The king once again rewards them, Matthias with the location of every known dungeon and Luri and Alma with a cash reward. Matthias realizes a demon is watching the throne room with a surveillance spell and manages to injure the demon on the other side. The king recognizes the demon's voice as Erhard, his former mage captain. With Erhard's location discovered Matthias decides to find him, but as it would take a year to travel the distance Matthias takes Luri and Alma into the mountains and introduces them to Iris the Darkness Dragon who, despite being unimaginably scary to the girls, is one of Gaius' defeated enemies. She revealed years previously an accidental magic explosion returned human society to the Dark Ages, explaining the current lack of magical knowledge, and also damaged her wings which Matthias now repairs. With Iris carrying them they travel the distance to Erhard in only one day. After breaking into Erhard's home Matthias exposes him from behind his spell of invisibility. Refusing to believe Matthias is the one who injured him due to how long it should have taken the real Matthias to travel from the academy Academy to his home, her heart attacks but is quickly weakened by the magi toxin on Alma's arrows, severely affecting his magic and making defeating him easy. Matthias also exposes a stronger mist demon hiding in the forest and after a short fight curses the demon with a spell to overload his magic, causing him to explode from the force of his own magic. The explosion uncovers a dragon vein pillar buried in the earth, a giant crystal that can tap into the magic power trapped in the earth. The demons had planned to summon an army of monsters just outside the city. Returning to the academy Matthias offer to vouch for Iris to attend the academy in human form. Due to her unfamiliarity with human behavior Iris laughably fails the written exam but is accepted after using unusual methods to defeat Guile in a sword duel and her magic almost destroying the academy arena which Matthias promises to repair. Preparation of the barrier goes slowly with only second academy students. The king requests first academy offer assistance but headmaster Fakus refuses to associate with their inferior academy. Matthias suggests holding a second inter-academy competition and Fakus Fakus agrees provided Matthias does not compete. Fakus brings 50 students to compete against 5 from 2nd Academy, but they easily win using wordless casting. The king, who had been observing, sees that Fakus had been forcing his students to ignore his order to switch to wordless casting and has Fakus arrested. Fakus students, who did not like him much, happily cooperate with 2nd Academy and learn wordless casting. Still requiring a much larger magi stone for the barrier Matthias takes the girls back into the dungeon, much deeper this time, and harnessing Iris magic summon a dragon. After after a long fight and using all their new skills the dragon is defeated and yields a magi stone of sufficient size for the barrier. Matthias also decides Iris has improved enough to become an official team member. Iris trains to be a better fighter with her human body while Matthias and Luri use the resources harvested from the dragon to make swords for themselves, a new bow for Alma and a spear for Iris capable of withstanding her power. As Matthias begins constructing the barrier the demons attack forcing Matthias to put Luri and Alma in charge of defending the city while he and Iris begin distributing adamantin to complete the barrier. The students hold back the demons while Luri crafts an arrow for Alma capable of defeating the first demon to attack. Following his death more demons arrive but Matthias, having finished the barrier in time, defeats them then activates the barrier, preventing demons from being able to enter the city ever again. Unfortunately, while the demons are defeated their army of monsters, summoned using another dragon vein pillar, is still outside the city. The students defeat defeat the first wave of monsters using wordless casting, then retreat so Matthias and his team can take the more powerful monsters. The most powerful, a void eater that consumes other monsters to grow, is manipulated by Matthias feeding it certain spells so that it will provide more useful resources once defeated. With the void eater defeated Matthias decides he has to leave the academy to find the dragon vein pillars. Edward lets him leave but keeps him listed as a scholarship student in case Matthias' adventures get him in political trouble the academy can then protect him from. Alma, Luri and Iris also become scholarship students so they can go with him on his quest. Matthias decides to explore Melchia dungeon but learns since he reincarnated an adventurer city has been built over it. Alma and Luri try to avoid passing through a forest on the journey but accidentally make Matthias curious when they mention an intelligent monster that lives there. As usual, Matthias easily defeats the monster. Reaching Melchia the group learn the Melchian lord has been making the city unsafe and controls the adventurer guild, meaning adventurers have to do whatever job he gives them. Most of the adventurers come back 
back from a monster hunt severely injured requiring Matthias to heal them. Matthias learns the previous lord passed away suspiciously, causing him to suspect the new lord is a demon making adventuring as dangerous as possible to kill off strong adventurers. He sends a secret letter to Edward to pass to the king then plans to spend the next day hunting the monster that injured the adventurers. However, due to the awkwardness of all sharing a room together Matthias and Luri do not sleep at all. Regardless they defeat the monster easily, drawing the attention of the lord who appears to have spies in the guild and even adventurers working directly for him who begin following them. Matthias easily leads the adventurers into a trap where Iris knocks them out. In response to his letter the king sends his royal proxy, Eik, to order Matthias to take Lord Dokiel into custody. Defeating Dokiel's guards Matthias arrests him and Eik takes him to face the king. Too late, Matthias realizes the demon controlling of Melchia have found the dungeon's dragon vein and summoned a monster horde outside the city. Entering the dungeon Matthias leaves Luri to cancel the spell placed on the vein by the demons, with Iris and Alma guarding her, while he locates the demon in charge. Eavesdropping on the demon's telepathic conversation Matthias determines there is an even higher ranked demon somewhere else advising the demon on how to beat Matthias. It is also revealed the master knows about the sorcerer Gaius, meaning he is very old, smart and powerful but is unsure if Matthias is Gaius reincarnation or not. Even with his master's help the demon is overwhelmed by Matthias and beheaded. Luri restores the vein, causing the summoned monsters to vanish. Via the remaining telepathy Matthias and the master demon casually threaten each other and decide to meet in the future. Matthias becomes excited at the thought of an actual challenge. Matthias had captured the demon's magical signature in a magistone but requires a device he created thousands of years ago as Gaius to track him. The device is currently across the border in the Redinia Alliance, a group of allied kingdoms, and to cross the border he needs permission from the king. Returning home they find the academy demolished to make way for a new upgraded academy. With permission to cross the border Matthias learns his device is in Fokia region, an area of such strong magic it is forbidden except for a rank adventurer so Matthias agrees to take the A rank promotion exam. The adventurer, Jiluas, is ranked S, higher than A, and is obsessed with fighting. He nonchalantly promotes Iris, Luri and Alma but insists on fighting Matthias who has become famous as a demon slayer. Jiluas proves to be the strongest opponent Matthias has faced, even able to copy Matthias' combat moves, yet Matthias is still victorious. After advising Jiluas how to get even stronger with spells Jiluas is grateful yet irritated at having to read books to learn. He advises them Fokia is dangerous and adventurers frequently vanish. Straight away in Fokia border guards try to secretly place demon tracking spells on them. Bandits attack but are swiftly put to sleep. Unfortunately Luri and Alma also accidentally fall asleep. The group continues to Fokia and they immediately sense 32 disguised devils, a type of demon that is weak at magic and prefer to fight in large groups. Rather than sneak past the town guards Matthias uncovers a concealed tunnel. Emerging into Fokia they see that citizens have all been hypnotized to keep them mindless while they work in a large factory. Protecting themselves from the spell they infiltrate the factory and find they are refining Lankan Demon Oregon. One ton of refined ore can make a bomb powerful enough to destroy an entire country though it is so rare collecting one ton takes decades. Facing devils is dangerous as they can use sense share, so once one devil is aware of them, all 32 of them will know as well. Using superior strategy strategy, the group begin killing the devils one by one until only 10 remain. The remaining 10 decide to use small pieces of ore to blow up the city, only for Jiluas to suddenly appear. With only the devil's leader remaining Jiluas duels him alone and Matthias is pleased to see Jiluas has already improved his spell casting. After a difficult fight the devil is defeated but not yet dead. The devil passes on a message he will soon be resurrected, then disintegrates. Matthias realizes the master demon responsible for Melchia was controlling the devil via necromancy to pass on the message. Jiluas names the factory's foreman the new lord of Fokia. Continuing on their journey they reach the ruins hiding the device and Matthias is forced to seal the fact it was he who built the ruins. Using his device Matthias confirms the master demon's name is Zardias and he was sealed long ago because he was too powerful to be killed. Matthias is certain he is too weak to defeat Zardias and even if he was strong enough their battle would likely destroy the world and push humanity to extinction. Desperate, Matthias uses the device to search for a sword he forged long ago and finds it is somewhere back home in the king's treasury. Zardias finally resurrects and flies to the kingdom to stop Matthias finding the sword. Alma and Luri search the treasury while Iris is almost killed instantly. Matthias is able to keep up with Zardias but is also injured and fears that defeating Zardias and saving humanity might just cost his life. Zardias reveals that all the demons Matthias has defeated have been resurrected inside the barrier to kill Luri and Alma. Luri and Alma are saved by Edward and the academy students and throw the sword to Matthias but Zardias stabs him. Matthias comes back to life, revealing the 
sword was the most powerful he ever created, if the wielder dies their life force is used to resurrect them. Zardias is defeated but before dying warns Matthias another demon will just replace him. The king once again gives them access to the treasury as a reward. Matthias discovers an adamantine arrow he crafted in his previous life but the matching bow is missing. He tracks the bow to the Isis company who, not knowing the value of adamantine melted it down so Matthias buys all their scrap metal as well as some magic stones for the girls. Guile informs Matthias of an incident where their neighboring Sahil Empire was attacked by an army of artificial doll soldiers. Due to the complex magic Matthias deduces a demon is responsible and may be in control of Sahil. Later, Luri suspects Matthias might kiss her but really he just made her a necklace from one of the jewels. Having fully recovered everyone decides to set off to Sahil for their next adventure. A girl named Rachel tells a boy named Bam to forget about her as she is climbing the tower to see the stars, disappearing into the gates. Bam suddenly finds himself within the first floor of the tower, with its caretaker Heden. Heden explains that all who wish to climb the tower must pass through a series of tests from each floor, with the first being to reach and break a ball behind a giant white steel-covered eel. Before he can enter the cage, however, a girl named Yuri and her companion Evan interrupts him gifting him a pocket holding information about the tower that can switch between visible and invisible, as well as allowing participants to understand the tower's language. Yuri also lends Bam a powerful sword known as Black March that can be dull or extremely sharp depending on the user, expressing curiosity in him despite knowing that her actions might incur the wrath of the higher-ups. Bam, deciphering the true nature of the test to be testing whether participants dare to embrace death, lets himself be eaten to cut it up from the inside. However, as Black March is unable to be wielded for him, Evan suggests suggests he request its strength, allowing Bam to break the ball and be transported to the next floor. To retrieve her sword, Yuri goes after him. On the second floor, Bam is greeted by 399 other floor contestants, with the next test being a killing match to whittle the number down to 200. Bam recalls how he was amnesiac and all alone in a dark cave until Rachel came and took care of him, including teaching him about the world and how to be literate. On the second floor, Bam encounters two other contestants Kun Aguero Agnes and Rack Wraithraiser. Both recognize the Black March due to a symbol on its hilt, which interests Kun greatly and makes Rack determined to hunt Bam down to become stronger. Kun forms an alliance with Bam, roping Rack in at the last second when the next test calls for teams of three to be formed between participants. On the mothership test administrator and ranker, someone who has climbed the tower before, Luro Ro challenges them to withstand his water barrier, which is formed using the tower's power known as Shinsu. All but Bam, who remains standing due to his supposed good luck, are pushed back by the Shinsu. As Luro Ro leaves after the test, he warns Bam not to get too close to Kun. The victors are taken to another room for the third test. As the groups filter in, a mysterious blonde figure recognizes Kun. In the new venue, Kun explains to a wonderstruck Bam that the sky here is an imitation created by Shinsu modeled after the legend, which he doubts exists. They meet the director of the test, Han Sung Yu, who challenges them to find the right door out of 12 identical ones within 10 minutes given only one chance, lest they be forcefully terminated. Although Kun tries to think, he is inadvertently haunted by his past of being betrayed by his half-sister Maria after she was chosen to become one of the elite girls, a princess of Jihad, through his help, thereby exiling the Aguero family as well. His mother Mother also warned him since then to never trust anyone and closed his heart off. As Kun panics, Rack pushes open a random door and Han Sung reveals the hidden condition to pass was to open any door within five minutes. Luro Ro then administers a bonus test where participation is voluntary, but all who pass it would be automatically granted permission to climb the tower. The test involves five rounds where a maximum of five teams attempt to steal a crown and remain on the throne for as long as possible, with two other members of the team acting as a defense. As the second round begins, Bam feels Black March reacts strangely as a girl resembling Rachel arrives. As the second round begins, Kun and a man from another team, Lauro, deduce that the one sitting on the throne is always at a disadvantage as more and more teams fight for the crown. However, Kun declines to participate just yet as Anak Jihad, a lizard-like girl, currently holds the crown, possessing immense power through her weapon Green April, which is part of a series of ignition weapon swords known as the 13-month series which includes Black March. This series of swords is so powerful it is only bestowed upon the princesses of Jihad, including Yuri and Anak, who asks Bam to hand it over. Anak makes a bet with Bam. If his team can win the game she will give him her sword, but if not he will give his to hers, and if he refuses to participate she will kill him and steal the sword after the game. As Loro's team fled back into their waiting room and Anak's trespassed, they are disqualified from the game. Kun pulls a series of tricks using his cloning bag and earns the crown first with Bam on the throne. A mysterious and ruthless team prepares to enter the game, including Rachel, who agrees to kill everyone. Kun makes countless copies of the crown and releases 
releases three other participants that he had allied with during the second round from his bottomless bag. The next round proceeds with the mysterious team entering the game, proving to be extremely powerful. Bam recognizes Rachel and jumps to protect her when she is attacked by a female masked player, the two getting struck on the head in the process and falling to the floor. As Bam vows to protect her, a strange explosion of Shinsu erupts, making it appear as if Bam had turned into Shinsu itself and willingly attacked the player, something that goes against the unbiased and absolute rules of the tower. The crown game ends without a victor as the crown is melted from the extreme power release and Bam had left the throne during the game. Due to his serious head injury, Bam is admitted to the infirmary. Rachel later pays him a visit where she meets Kun and begins to ask for a favor. Meanwhile, Luro Ro approaches Hansung questioning his reasons for having him administer this bonus round. Hansung cautions that as administrators, they are present to prevent anyone potentially dangerous from claiming the tower's power, with Bam hinted to be one such dangerous person. Five days have passed since the crown game. Rachel requests that Kun lie to Bam that she was never here to prevent both of them becoming each other's burdens, although Kun quickly sees that she doesn't really care about Bam and works to distance the both of them, fulfilling Rachel's request in the process. Anak steals the Black March, but it refuses to listen to her. After Bam reawakens, Kun tells him about how Luro Ro assigned them all positions in their teams to start the fourth test, Fisherman, Close Quarter Combat, Spear Bearer, Attacking from Distance, Lighthouse Bearer, Illuminating the Tower and Information Gathering, Scout, Observe the Enemy's Movement and Assist the Fisherman, and Wave Controller, Support and Control the Battle with Shinsu. Bam receives the Wave Controller position, a position that utilizes Shinsu to support team members. In order for Shinsu to be used above limits, contracts must be formed with the Floor Masters using their pockets, but Bam is warned by the Floor Bearers that receiving the contract will only shackle him. Everyone works hard in order to pass in their classes. During mealtimes, Bam meets Androsi Jihad, a princess of Jihad in her own right who labels Anak as an imposter. Kun later finds out that even though Anak was supposedly made a princess of Jihad after climbing the tower, she is currently in the midst of passing the tower's tests and records claim her to be deceased. As an enraged Anak and Androsi battle in their class, the current Anak is revealed to be the real princess's daughter whose parents were killed by the other princesses, prompting her to enter the tower for revenge. Jihad is the first man to have ever climbed the tower, become the king of all who lives in it today. Indorsi likens the princesses of Jihad to luxurious shoes in a display cabinet. Once they are granted Jihad's power, they are forbidden to do certain things, such as engaging in intercourse and bearing children to prevent the inheritance of Jihad's power. Their fight ends with both Indorsi and Anak falling into a pit and ending up seriously injured. In the final placement test, participants, all but Rack and Ghost who have already passed, are required to play a game of tag in a separate building while they split into Team A and B respectively. With each team's members required to help their own, it, steal the badge from the other teams, it, or reach the goal. Kun's strategy, delay Quant long enough so that Anak their secret, it, can make it out the bridge and pass the test. When Quant reaches the bridge he finds Kun instead of Anak. Kun lies that Anak jumped off the bridge, but in reality, she is safely floating on lighthouse under the bridge, which Quant figures it out. Quant jumps down the bridge, forcing Kun with him in an attempt to get his lighthouse to fall, but Kun is saved by Anak using the green April as a vine rope. Down the bridge Quant surprisingly finds Kun and Lao Ro, who offer him a ride up the bridge to steal Anak's badge. It is later revealed Kun betrayed his own team so that his friends, especially Bam, on Team B could pass the test. With Team A losing the game, Team B enters next. Unlike Team A who established their roles clearly and quickly, Team B fights among themselves over who will be it. Indorsi herself declares she will be it. Serena's backstory is revealed. She was once a burglar, and one night she watched as her friend were killed by a rancor which lead to her becoming a regular. In the present time, Quant catches up in Dorsey and her team as she shockingly seems to turn against her team as well. Indorsi reveals that she intends to kill the other two fishermen on Team B to assure she passes the test. Bam runs to Rachel and he and Quant discover that Ho is holding Rachel hostage at knife point. Ho tells Bam that he will lose motivation to climb the tower if he kills Rachel, as he has uncovered by an anonymous letter, giving him leverage in passing the test. Rachel tries to break free from Ho's hold and he accidentally stabs her in the back. To Quant's amazement, Bam uses a Shinsu technique that took him hundreds of years to master to paralyze, recovering Rachel who is now bleeding badly. Ho, realizing he was set up and grieving in how he is once again powerless, remembering how his reason for entering the inner tower was that his entire race was murdered as he watched helplessly, takes the knife and stabs himself through the chest, killing himself. Serena and Indorsi arrive at the scene and Indorsi uses a weapon taken by one of the fishermen she presumably killed to attack Quant. Along with Bam's help, Indorsi recovers Quant's badge and Team B wins. Ho's corpse and Rachel are taken to emergency care and the episode ends with Bam at Rachel's bedside. Bam reveals to Kun and Rack 
fact that Rachel may never walk again after her injury. Bam invites his peers to a small funeral set up for Ho and they have a remembrance party for him later that night. Knowing she won't pass the latest test and feeling that her purpose isn't there, Serena leaves the inner tower and gives Shibisu her knife as a parting gift. Test director Han Sung Yu runs into wave controller teacher Yuga holding a secret call who reveals that his true identity is Lo Pabia Run, a member of the Royal Enforcement Division. He is on a mission to retrieve the Green April and possibly destroy the False Princess, the Second Anak Jihad. Yu unexpectedly allows Rin to pursue his mission. The next morning, the participants learn of their overall test results and whether they passed or not. Han Sung Yu announces that since she was injured in the last test, Rachel has failed. In an attempt to save her status, Kun asks for permission to take the administrator's test. Yu reminds him that only irregulars have the power to consult with the administrator, in which Bam notifies him that he is one. This revelation surprises many of the participants. Bam is then taken to the administrator in order to speak with him. After consulting with the administrator, Bam succeeds in getting permission to take the administrator's test. If the pass, then Rachel will move on. For the test, Bam and Rachel are placed into an underwater shinsu ball along with fish and must be captured by net dolphins and eaten by their queen to pass. The remaining participants must stop the net dolphins' enemies the goblins, who control marsh worms, and striped ground pigs, from interfering with the net dolphins. They must also watch out for the bull, a mysterious and dangerous creature that eats almost anything that moves. In the caves, Shibisu runs into the bull after receiving a warning from Hats that the two participants who were with him have gone missing. Shibisu is saved by Anak and Endorsi, who arrive just in the nick of time. However, the two start competing and betting against each other to see will defeat the bull first. The bull however, runs off and Endorsi and Anak follow, leading them to become separated. In Dorsey runs into the bull, which is now stronger, and she left nearly unconscious. Anak on the other hand, runs into Lo Pabia Ren, who stabs her through the torso. Ren is now controlling the bull and it brings a captured Endorsi to him, who is ordered by Ren to kill the Anak, the imposter princess. Meanwhile, Hats, Rack, and Pericule are keeping an eye on the goblins. Kun instructs them to wait before moving in, but there are more of them than expected. As one of the goblins prepares to attack Hats, Pericule reflexively skewers it with his spear, prompting the rest of the goblins to attack. After initially running away from the goblins, Rack turns around to attack the goblins, joined by others from the team. Meanwhile, Lauro follows Kun's orders and seals several underground tunnels leading the striped ground pigs to the goblins. The two enemies fight each other, allowing Bam and Rachel safe passage. Underground Anak is nearly defeated by Lo Pabia Ren but Endorsi chooses to fight alongside her. Together they are still not powerful enough to defeat Lo Pabia Ren, but as they fight Princess Yuri arrives and recognizes her blade she loaned to Bam. Annoyed with the situation, she works with her team to kill Lo Pabia Run. As he dies he laughs, admitting that during the fight he sent the bull to kill Bam and Rachel. The bull arrives underwater to kill them and gets several good hits before Bam uses his special Shinsu to defeat the bull. As they rise upward about to complete the test successfully Rachel stands up and pushes Bam over the edge. Some of Rachel's backstory is revealed. She believed the tower was calling for her, but when she arrived Heden tells her that the tower did not call her at all and that she is too weak to enter. Desperate to become special, she begs for any kind of chance. Heden holds her immobile and she watches as Bam arrives and is able to defeat the first test. She is jealous of Bam and wants to be special. Eden gives her a special test, telling her that she will be allowed to climb if she defeats Bam with her own two hands. She demands a special weapon, since Bam was given an amazing weapon in front of her, and Eden gives her a bodyguard that will die in her place once, allowing her to essentially have two lives. She makes her way through the tower knowing that she must kill Bam but unable to bring herself to do it. She becomes more and more jealous, urging him to stay away from her in her mind. She is told that that if she waits long enough and follows the signs given, she'll be given a chance to kill him. So she allows herself to be taken by Ho and uses the bodyguard to die and return. She waits until Bam is injured then pushes him into the Shinsu lake to kill him. When the others find her alone, they ask where Bam is and she says the bull came then passes out. Everyone assumes Bam is defeated and decide that as a favor to him they will help Rachel reach the top. Rachel, resting in her room after the trial, laughs wildly then covers her face conflicted over what she's done but still determined to reach the top. After everyone leaves for the next level, Bam wakes up in a deep cavern badly hurt. He remembers Rachel pushing him. He decides he needs to climb to tower in order to find his own answers. On his last day of middle school, Rentaro Ajo gets turned down by a girl for the 100th time. He goes to a shrine and prays for a girlfriend, and a god appears and tells him that in high school, he will meet not one, but 100 soulmates who will all fall in love with him. On his first day of high school, Rentaro simultaneously bumps into two girls, Hakari Hanazono and Karain Inda who are both his soulmates and begin vying for his affections. Back at the shrine, the god tells Rentaro that a person is supposed to only have one soulmate if any, 
but because he made a mistake on the paperwork, Rintaro wound up with 100 of them. Because Hikari and Karain are both among his soulmates, he is unable to choose between them, and even if he did, any soulmate who does not get into a relationship with him will die. Rintaro briefly considers dating both of them behind each other's back, but decides against it. Finally he asks both of them to be his girlfriends at the same time, which they agree to. Learning that Rentaro has never kissed a girl before, Hakari and Karain start trying to get Rentaro's first kiss. To be fair to both, Rentaro devises an elaborate game that will let him kiss them both without anybody knowing who got it first. They try it several times, but things keep going wrong. Rentaro attempts to surrender his first kiss to the lascivious vice principal, only for the girls to tell them the other should have it, and so the three agree to have a three-way kiss. Rentaro meets his third soulmate, a shy girl named Shizuka Yoshimoto who only communicates by pointing to words in a book. She loans him her favorite book, which they bond over. Later, Rentaro asks Shizuka to install a text-to-speech app on her phone and then sends her a file containing the entire text of the book, allowing her to speak without breaking eye contact with the other person. Shizuka realizes that since the book was not released in an ebook format, Rentaro must have transcribed it manually by himself. Later, Rentaro asks Hikari and Karain to let Shizuka become his third girlfriend, vowing to commit seppuku if he cannot be a good boyfriend to them all. Rentaro proposes a game of old maid to get Shizuka broken into the group, with the added penalty of the loser getting tickled by the winner. He wins the first three rounds, with each round leaving a different girl in last place. Shizuka wins the fourth round, but only goes about gently poking Rentaro. Sensing hostility from Karain, he steps out to let the girls talk thing out among themselves. Karain tells Shizuka that she does not need to hold back because she is just as loved by Rentaro as the other girls. When he returns, Shizuka decides she is ready for a kiss with him. Rentaro meets and falls in love with his fourth soulmate, the beautiful Nano EIAI, who is the school's top performer and rumored to be a robot due to her intelligent and emotionless personality. She initially is not interested in Rentaro and repeatedly declines his attempts to open up to her due to considering him insignificant, but she becomes overwhelmed by thoughts about him that night. Rentaro requests a date with her to prove himself the following day, and the two visit an amusement park. Nano is befuddled by the attractions, and at the end of the day believes she gained nothing from the outing. But Rentaro proves she did gain something by almost burning the photos he took during the date, leading Nano to break down in tears and she asks Rentaro out. He accepts, and she makes it official with a surprise kiss. He then introduces her to his other girlfriends. The other girls are a little jealous Rentaro went on a date with Nano, something they haven't done yet, so Hikari suggests they all go to an indoor water park. On Hikari's suggestion, Rentaro and the girls visit an indoor water park. Karain sits at one of the sun benches wrapped in a towel due to claims of feeling chilly, Shizuka gets caught in a whirlpool due to her inability to swim, and Rentaro passes out from a nosebleed when girls draw a lot of attention to him. Due to being unable to perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on him, Hikari and Nano search for a male lifeguard, only to be accosted by three perverted guests. Rentaro is awoken when Karain tells him of the situation, and the perverts leave in disgust when Hikari and Nano both kiss him. Rentaro rescues Shizuka from the whirlpool before ascertaining that Karain is actually embarrassed about her own figure rather than feeling chilly. He removes her robe in one motion, revealing a white bikini she looks great in. To prove he's not patronizing her, he draws her into a hug, and she notices his heart is racing even faster than hers. With the whole gang back together at last, the pool date begins in earnest. Rentaro meets his fifth soulmate, but does not get the chance to talk to her. He returns to where he saw her the following day, finding in the chemistry lab a young girl named Kasuri Yukusen. Kasuri serves him a flask of tea before going through an assortment of drugs she invented, after which Kasuri reveals that she spiked the tea she served him with a love potion due to falling in love with him at first sight. Rentaro attempts to regurgitate the love potion, but the drug quickly overwhelms him, forcing Kasuri to administer a neutralizer. After the drug is cleared from Rentaro's system, Kasuri repeats her confession, taking on the appearance of the girl Rentaro saw the day before. Realizing the third-year chemistry club president really is his soulmate, Rentaro returns Kusuri's confession. Meeting the other girls, Kusuri gifts them with a variety of drugs based on what Rentaro told her about them. She then serves them cookies and two flasks of tea, one for Rentaro and one for the girls. Everyone assumes the big one is for the girls, not realizing until too late that it was spiked with a drug to get Rentaro to kiss Kusuri. Rentaro and Kusuri attempt to reach the chemistry lab in order to create enough 
antidote for the other four girls, who are in a zombie-like state pursuing Rentaro for a kiss. Both groups split up, with Shizuka pursuing Rentaro first. He takes her to the nurse's office when she trips, hanging her up on a clothes hanger. He is next pursued by Hikari and Karain, but he escapes them by making them kiss each other. He finds that Nano has beaten him to the chemistry lab, and he finds Kasuri hiding in a nearby locker. She tries to age herself up to sneak past Nano, but she gives herself away. Rentaro escapes to a nearby closet, but Nano reaches him, kissing him until Kasuri approaches with an antidote. She administers antidote to the other girls, after which Hikari and Karain bashfully claim not to remember anything. Kasuri apologizes for the ordeal, but Rentaro promises to continue loving her even if she keeps making drugs. Hikari invites the others to a nearby park hosting a bouquet toss, where the winner gets to have their picture taken with their special someone. Among the participants is the Garaira Alliance motorcycle gang, which leads to Rentaro and the girls working together to catch the bouquet. Shizuka wins the bouquet toss for the newly christened Rentaro family, and Hikari wins a chopstick lottery to decide who gets to wear the dress for the photo. All the other girls are invited to be in the photo, and afterward, Hikari asks Rentaro to break up with her. He follows her to her home, where she explains that her mother, Hahari, found out about Rentaro and all the girls he was dating and is planning to transfer Hikari to a new school. After wandering through town, Rentaro decides to take his chances and break into the Hanazono mansion to rescue Hikari, with all the other girls deciding to join in on the mission as well. Rentaro and the girls infiltrate the Hanazono residence to rescue Hikari. She doesn't answer her phone, and they fail to get her attention from outside the mansion. Unlocking the door through a pet door, the group manages to evade the guards and pets wandering the place. Kusuri offers up a drug she was planning to mail to a pharmaceutical company as part of a job application in order to get past a set of infrared sensors, with Rentaro and Karain climbing past them together. As the other girls retreat back outside, Rentaro and Karain make their way to Hikari's room, only to trigger an alarm, which leads to them being captured and escorted to Hahari's chamber. Rentaro pleads his case with Hahari, but she rejects him, not wanting Hikari to experience the same heartbreak she did at her age. Hahari is soon revealed to be Rentaro's sixth soulmate once the drug wears off. Hahari subjects Rentaro to a lie detector test to determine his feelings for her daughter. He passes the pest trial with flying colors, after which a maid informs Hahari that Hikari is trying to jump out the window. Karain takes Hahari hostage while Rentaro goes to save Hikari. He succeeds in talking her out of killing herself, but they both fall out the window, with him redirecting their fall into the fountain. As Karain and Hahari emerge from the mansion, the latter realizes that Rentaro wasn't lying about his love for Hikari and proving that he'll make her happy even if it kills him. She relents and formally asks him to take care of her daughter, with Rentaro promising to take care of both of them and accepting her earlier confession, to the shock of the other girls. Afterwards, Hahari invites Rentaro and the other girls to stay the night at the mansion. After washing in the bath, the girls are dressed up in pajamas, after which Hahari gets a nosebleed cause of the overbearing cuteness of the girls. Rentaro goes with her to treat her nosebleed. As Rentaro is stripped down in the Hahari's bedroom, a scream from the former causes the other girls to think Hahari is trying to get a head start on Rentaro. But when they get there, they find Rentaro dressed as a girl, causing him to faint in embarrassment. After being awoken by a kiss from Prince Nano, Rentaro leaves to take a bath. The Hanazonos follow after him to try and peep on him, being joined by all the other girls except Chizuka, who gets tied up in a blanket to stop her from interfering. Failing to see anything through the bathhouse window, the group ventures into the attic. As the Hanazono's cat follows them up there, Shizuka rolls her way to the bathhouse, getting pushed into the water by the Hanazono's dog. Rentaro accidentally exposes himself to Shizuka, and after the rest of the girls emerge from the attic, Karain blurts their intentions to Rentaro who immediately lectures the girls. Later that night, he finds Hahari at an altar for Hikari's late father and assuages her fears of unfaithfulness before kissing her. As he wanders the mansion alone, he meets the ghost of Hikari's father, who thanks Rentaro for helping Hahari move on from his death before ascending to heaven. After leaving to collect their uniforms the following morning, Rentaro and the girls discover that Hahari had bought out the school to become the new chairwoman so she could spend time with Rentaro.